This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Um, I want to start with Rick, and I think perhaps the best place to start, you're credited as a consulting producer. Mm -hmm. If you could maybe tell us a little bit about what that role entails um, and, and what your role was in relationship sure. to the series. Um, the title means uh, so many different things depending on who's filling the job. And so, so it's not, um, it's not a well-defined title. So you sort of define it by what you do. Mm -hmm. and. Um, a number of years ago, uh, one of the guys I work with in the independent film world um, is married to a costume designer. And um, she had been hired to do an independent film called Afternoon Delight. And they were looking for some um, financing and some producing and some counseling. And, um, and so uh, I read the script. And um, what I like to do before I meet with a writer or director is is to send them a set of my notes just so they're not uh, sort of bushwhacked. And, and so, um, you know, I sent out a bunch of notes and Jill Soloway walked into my office and uh, she sat down and, and she said, you know, I don't really want to be here. And I said, okay, where would you like to be? And she said, oh, I'd rather be home doing your notes. They were fantastic. And I went, don't oversell Jill. <laughs> and, and so, you know, that was my introduction to Jill Soloway, who's an incredibly creative, enthusiastic person. And, um, and we began a dialogue, and that dialogue led to uh, her doing a rewrite, incorporating some of these ideas that I had in, in um, her script. And then uh, off she went to shoot, and I was involved in another film. I never saw a foot of film, and I got a call from her, and she said, would I come? and look at the director's cut. Mm. So I said, sure. So I came and I, and I watched this cut, and, and she said, so what do you think? And I said, well, you know, I have a couple of thoughts. And she said, well, I'd like you to come uh, to the cutting room with me and spend you know, some time with me. And I said, I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I mean, it, I, I'm very honest, and it's not pleasant, <laughs> and I don't think you want to do that. And she said, no, no, I do, I do. And I said, no, well, listen, I would not invite myself to come to the editing room <laughs> if I were doing a film. And she said, no, really, it'll be good. And so I spent two weeks with Jill, and we sat, like, really tight. I mean, like this <laughs> the whole time. And she liked, I don't know, she just sort of liked to go like this all the time. And so I'd be in the cutting room, and, you know, and they would say, I would say, you know, I, I think that scene's way too long. And they go, yeah, I know, but, um, you know, we don't have any coverage. And, and so, uh, and I go, well, you know, I think we can take about a minute and a half out. And she would go, well, how are you gonna do that? And I go, I don't know, I just got here, hang on. Mm -hmm. And then I would make this suggestion, and, and she and the editor would both look at me and go, well, that's never gonna work. Mm -hmm. And I go, yeah, that's probably not. But <laughs> we're here, let's try it. And then they would try it, and they go, oh my God, how did that work? And I said, I don't know, I got lucky or something, but, um, you know, and so that would go on for a couple uh -huh. of days. And then after a while, they'd stop going, well, that's never gonna work. <laughs> and they would just kind of play around, and things happened, and we had a really good time mm -hmm. together. And so um, the film went on to win the best director at uh -huh. Sundance, and, uh, and then Jill um, got this pilot, and I actually met with uh, Amazon uh, about possibly producing it, and it didn't work out, and then this, it got picked up as a series, and she said, well, I want you to come on mm -hmm. to the series. And I said, well, you know, what would I do? And she said, well, I'd like you to do exactly what you did on uh, Afternoon Delight. So I said, well, what, what exactly was that? And she said, well, <laughs> if you could read the outlines and give notes and then read the scripts and give notes and then um, come into the cutting room and give notes. And so that's, how, that's pretty much how my, um, my job evolved. 
You gave a lot of notes. So I gave a lot of notes. (laughs) You gave a lot of notes to the show's creator. I'd imagine working that closely with with Jill, um, there was bound to be some creative tension along the way, some disagreements, some some creative disagreements. Yeah, I think there always is. I mean, I might tell a story out of school at the end of this, but I might not. But um, (laughs) we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, But, you know, I knew also my place. Uh And, and, you know, I'm a director, and when I'm directing, you know, I exercise one set of muscles, and when I'm producing, I, uh-huh. I hopefully exercise a different uh-huh. set of muscles, and they're, and they're different. You know, as a producer, you're trying to coach your director to mm-hmm. do the best he or she can do. Mm-hmm. When you're directing, you're doing it. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a different set of, of muscles. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have really strong ideas about things, but there are times um, where early on in the outlines, I would say, I think this is missing. I'll give you an example of that in a second. Um, I think this is missing, and sometimes it would be met with, yeah, maybe, I don't think so. And I go, okay. And then we get to the next stage, and I mean, one thing is I'm really consistent as a person, I think. And so, <clears throat> you know, the things I like, I like, and the things I don't like, I don't like, and it doesn't change over mm-hmm. a lot of time. <laughs> so the script would come out, and I would say, oh, you know, I, I really think you need, and, and, you know, generally the response would be, yeah, we heard that before. And then we'd be shooting. And I'd, I'd make one last gasp effort. And so, for example, in the second show you saw, um, the kids leave the house. And originally in the outline and in the screenplay, that's the last you ever see of them. Mm-hmm. You, don't see, uh, you don't see the older sister on the bus, and you don't see the, uh, the son and the, uh, the brother in the, uh, in the car with the babysitter. Mm-hmm. And my early note on was, I think you just need one more beat for a couple of reasons um, with those characters. Otherwise, they disappear completely from the show. And uh, Can I stop you just yep. to, so to explain to the audience what you mean by a beat? Uh, it's it's uh, between a carrot and a uh, turnip. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. Uh, okay. A moment, a moment, okay. sorry, a moment. Okay. a moment. Well, somebody did that to me one time. I said to an actor, <laughs> you know, you need to take a beat there. And he was like, you know, I don't do that. I don't take beats. You want to go for carrots, yeah. you know, and all that. Anyway, so, so there's, a, there's a moment that I felt, you know, you, you just don't want to... Uh, introduce these characters in the beginning of the show and then you never see them again. Mm-hmm. And also, that's not the nature of the arc of this whole show. I mean, it's very much a family mm-hmm. dynamic. And so, um, I was making no progress there. <laughs> so I've been shined on at the, at, the, uh, at, the, at the outline, I've been shined on at the, brushed off at the script stage, but I was still fighting. I mean, we were down to the last day of shooting, basically, I was saying, Jill, I am telling you, in my bones, I believe you need these two moments. Mm-hmm. Well, how am I going to do that? I said, well, we got a parking lot. You're mm-hmm. on the stage. You're on the lot. All we need is a school bus. There's one. I saw one when I drove in and a car. I know we've got cars. And we've got the actors. Let's just, just trust me. Just do that. So she said, all right, all right. And she picked up the phone and she called. The, she said, oh, Rick's got this idea. I guess we should try it out. You know, I got, after a while, I was called the old white guy. So actually, the way the conversation went, the old white guy's got this idea. Can we just try it? So anyway, I mean, I thought when you, when you see that, for me, there's, a, there's just enough of, of keeping those two stories alive mm-hmm. because they pay off later sure. in the sure. arc of the, mm-hmm. of, of the whole show. Sure. Um, so... You know, and the dynamic in, uh, as a consultant, you are a consulting mm-hmm. producer. You're not, uh, you're not there every day. You're not necessarily on the set all the time. So um, you sort of have to, uh, you have to find your sweet spot. Where are people going to listen to you? Where can you make suggestions and not be too intrusive? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, I am going back, so... Uh, I guess, you know. For series two. For, they're having yeah, you back. Yeah, they're having me back. So okay. I think. I mean, I, you know, as of uh, yesterday, yes. So, uh, so I think that's happening. So, uh, so I think that there's a balancing act. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you know, it, it, I think creativity requires strong opinions. And mm-hmm. so uh, film and mm-hmm. television is a collaborative art. And you're going to mm-hmm. have strong opinions. And you should have strong opinions. Mm-hmm. And you should be able to handle pushback. And if you trust, I mean, if you come in mm-hmm. with the overall trust of these are people I want to work with and I trust, and, you know, I mean, we had a couple of battles. There's a little battle about the end of the last show you saw 
um, a couple of lines that I think went too far, and I wanted to keep it more interesting, abstractly mm -hmm. interesting. But um, you know, and I and I lost that battle. And in the end, I said, you know, it's your show. Mm. I mean, I think I said a few other things too. But <laughs> but in the end, what I meant was, you know, I mean, I if it were my show, this would be the ending. But it's your show, and I'll fight with you, I'll argue with you, I'll disagree with you. But in the end. I know who's got to make that decision. Yeah, absolutely. So. I, I want to take a step back um, away from the process and talk about the distribution outlet and talk about Amazon. Right. What, why Amazon? What relationship um, do these, spa what relationship did the Amazon share with the show? How did it evolve with Amazon? Um, why didn't it evolve for another outlet, MTV, HBO? I, you know, I don't know the, uh, I don't know the history that well, but mm -hmm. what I will tell you is that, um, Amazon was very small. They have very few people mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Lewis, the key creative person involved, in, and one other person at the beginning. And um, in the, in the process was very streamlined, and it was much more like a f in the film. <laughs> there were very few people. And I think also the sensibility um, from Amazon was we get Jill Soloway's mm. sensibility from Afternoon Delight. And if we could bottle that sensibility into a weekly installment, that would be what we'd like to do. Well, that's what they did, basically. And they sort of left Jill alone. And I mean, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty risky uh, series. Sure. I mean, it takes, it takes a lot of risk, mm -hmm. and they were willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was evident to her right away as sure. soon as she started working with her. Sure. It's, so they were quite hands off of the creative You know, process. they were, they, and uh, there's a lot of dialogue. I mean, there's, there's a kind of hands on, there's, I mean, there's lots of notes that we would get, mm -hmm. but the attitude um, was here are notes, um, you should hear them. Uh -huh. And there you go. <laughs> and that was pretty, I mean, that's very unusual for, uh, a creative process in, in television. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to switch to, to Clint um, because, because the show is quite provocative. It is, mm -hmm. um, it raises a lot of questions and I'm sure that there are a lot of questions in the audience and it may mm -hmm. be good to sort of uh, reflect on the terminology, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do we talk about these issues? How do we ask our questions? Um, enlighten us. Well, 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 thank you. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think terminology is it's quite provocative, as you say. I think um, when we're thinking about the transgender community, um, we, we're, we're thinking about an umbrella of different types of communities, right? We, have, we see in, the, in, the, in one of the episodes uh, cross-dressers and trans people and um, gender non-conforming people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to kind of just you know, sit and analyze the terminology they use for one another. Um, so, for example, if you're thinking about cross-dressing, right, um, people who may identify as one specific type of gender, but their gender presentation changes whenever they're in that specific either situation or they want to project that specific type of gender when they are in a specific situation. Mm -hmm. Rather, when you think about transgender people, there's the, the big difference between sex and gender, right? Mm -hmm. Sex, I, I like to think of it as an assigned category, uh, a category that was assigned to someone at birth rather than gender, which is something that uh, it's innate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how people usually perceive themselves and feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, and transgender trans transcends sex, right? And we're thinking about how does uh, gender actually affect the way in which people navigate the world. In mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, sort of continuing that thought, because I mean, television history is not mm -hmm. ripe with representations of trans characters. Mm -hmm. um, this makes this show both once at the same time very meaningful, but it also places a really high burden on the show. Um, can you talk a little bit about that tension? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, and I actually, uh, I was really thinking about the, that, this specific question about uh, the creation of a new narrative of transgender characters. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen that in a couple in the couple in a couple of years or so, we've seen the rise of television shows that are featuring transgender characters, um, where you can see their few humanity. Right, we see the the ways in which they are interacting with family members in schools, in the workplace, and how they are navigating the ways in which they identify themselves mm -hmm. and how they want the world to see them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I am very interested in seeing this switch in the narrative, right? We're not seeing a pathologized transgender person. We are seeing 
tra uh, characters that allows them to be their full human beings and the humanity of every single character um, and the transgender folks. Mm -hmm. So I am I, I'm, I'm actually, I, I applaud the ways in which this show is creating a new version of transgender people sure. and allowing them to be true humans rather than just pathologies that we have seen for a while. Sure. Rick, do you know much, do you have much insight into sort of Jill's um, investment in diversifying her writer's room and diversifying her cast? Um, I mean, she made a very strong commitment to mm -hmm. do that. And, you know, I think it's all, um, it, it falls in line with sort of her evolution and her interest in creating this show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm struck um, in, the, in the first episode you saw of, of uh, Mara's statement, uh, I'm, I'm a person, I'm sorry about the uh, he and the she and, the, you know, and, and I think this idea of person mm -hmm. is really powerful mm -hmm. and, and that transcends gender and sex mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I, to me, and that may be too easy, but the idea of person is very strong. Yes. You know, I think it also, the show, it's, it's educating people at the same time, right? The he and the she sometimes becomes very problematic because you really don't want to misgender someone's, someone or use the wrong name mm -hmm. at the same time. But it's also allowing them to understand that um, it's an educational process for people who are going through um, the transition, right? Mm -hmm. Especially the family members and mm -hmm. the people that have perceived them in one particular way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're going to be transitioning to become who they feel, really feel who they are. Sure. Yeah, but the more but the more specific each character is allowed to be. I mean, I did twenty. I I, can't, I have to th do the math, but tw twenty years ago, I guess, uh, I did a show called Life Goes On, mm -hmm. and it had a, a featured a family that um, you know had a Down syndrome son, and you know our Down syndrome character was very very specific, mm -hmm. very high functioning, and one of the issues was that we got a tremendous amount of mail saying, you know, we were thinking of terminating our pregnancy when we found out we had a Downs child, but having seen your show, um, and, and it placed, as you were saying, it, it places this very high responsibility sure. on, yeah. on being as accurate as possible, but, mm -hmm. but also specific. I mean, the character of Corky in, in Life Goes On was very specific mm -hmm. and had limitations. Sure. Yeah. And, I, and I think that each character needs to be allowed. I mean, the, the real... The real non-prejudice to me becomes when characters are allowed to exist as characters mm -hmm. and not being defined by a label, you sure. know? Mm -hmm. and, and I certainly think the show is, is going toward that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and allowing the, the fluidity for that, right, right for that character yeah. to not only find his own humanity, but allowing the audience to feel that humanity. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Fantastic, I'm getting the signal that it's time to turn to the audience for questions. Um, because Amazon Prime is such a new like medium of distribution, was it difficult finding like a cast and crew? Um, no, I think that um, one of the ways Amazon got into the business as a player was to understand that they would have to, you know, they couldn't sort of sneak in the back door and say, oh, we're going to make television for less. I think their message was, we're here to play with the with the with the big. Uh, players and we're willing to show that mm -hmm. by paying decent wages and and um, you know decent budgets for for the show so you know it's it's probably less money than um, certain network shows but there are very few uh, single camera half-hour network shows too so it's it's hard to compare apples to apples but there you know it's a it's um they believe in the show they spend money when they have to um, uh, if you follow the show, this is one of the uh, 108, the opening song is different from, uh, there was a song they licensed for most of the shows, but there was, a, there was an idea early on that we would use a different uh, song from that period uh, for each episode as the opening song, and then that became, that was too expensive, mm -hmm. but the idea was really good, and so they picked a couple of select places where they could use the opening song, and then it wraps around at the end, so it sort of as bookends. One of the things that makes this show groundbreaking is that it's a Jewish family and a non-stereotypical Jewish family, which isn't there on TV very much. Do you know if Jill Soloway encountered any um, opposition to that from Amazon, Amazon or anyone along the way? 
I mean, if she did, I never, I never saw that. I mean, that was, you know, this was part of, I mean, Jill's a very strong creative force, and I think, you know, her feeling was, this is what, I, this is what I'm doing, <laughs> and uh, if you're buying in, you're buying in, and if you're not, tell me now, and, you know, we'll uh, look elsewhere. So I think that from the start, I think she's very clear on what she wanted to do, and um, no, I mean, I do think that that's a unique aspect of it, and, uh, you know, I think that also makes it very, um, very personal for Jill, and, you know, Jill's sister is one of the writers as well, and uh, so there's, there's, um, th there's, a, there's an authenticity to that. Hi there, uh, and I think this question can kind of go to both of you. Um, so with television shows that are usually on TV, uh, they have to kind of um, tie in with the advertisements and uh, content-wise and um, be a little more conservative. Uh, with with uh, streaming services like Netflix and Amazon, um, how does this change the creative process? Because um, I know like you do a lot of notes on the script, um, and how does that tie into like what can be represented um, in television, um, at least with streaming services. Um, I know a lot of people mention Orange is a New Black uh, bringing a new angle um, to um, television, um, and I see the show kind of doing the same thing. Uh, some of the questions have been asked, so um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, because Amazon doesn't, um, because the shows aren't funded by commercials, there aren't, there aren't sponsors and companies <laughs> and all that. I mean, there's one company, and it's Amazon. And so, you know, if Amazon's uncomfortable about something, it's Amazon. It's not Chevrolet or, uh, you know, or any other kind of um, sponsor. So, you're, you know, again, it's kind of streamlined. The process is streamlined. You're not uh, constantly looking over your shoulder uh, wondering if this will offend a certain um, sponsor or a certain segment. Um, you're really just dealing with that, that streamlined uh, approval. But it, it probably wouldn't have worked on NBC, for example. Right, right. <laughs> right. Although, what's, I think what's happening is that the networks, in order to stay in business, sure. are constantly pushing the limits toward, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, ca more cable mm -hmm. content or, or, in this case, um, uh, internet content. Sure. And, um, you know, and, and it will change the format. I mean, I think we're going to see more... Uh, limited series, which I think are great. Um, and, w and one of the reasons is, you know, Jill and I had conversations about, I, I feel like um, this uh, limited series that, that you can uh, watch all at once is really the novel of the 21st century. And so, you know, you have the ability, because w we shot all 10 episodes, um, we're working all 10 episodes essentially at once. That doesn't mean we're cutting all 10 at once. We cut them in order, but we have some time so that sometimes you'll look at a scene in, in uh, episode three and you go, I don't really think this fits here, but it'd be great to open episode five mm -hmm. with this scene. You'd never be able to do that in, in network series. Fantastic. We have a question here in the middle. Hi. Um, I would just like to preface my question by saying like, I love the show, and I think Jeffrey Tambor is amazing as Mora. Um, so Jill Soloway has talked about uh, what she calls transformative action, which is uh, what they mentioned in the intro, hiring 20 trans crew members and 60 trans extras and actors. So uh, that's, that's clearly like a very progressive standpoint and it's very, um, it's kind of a political statement too. So my question is, um, why the decision to cast as a cisgendered straight white male as Mora in the lead? You know, I can't, I can't answer that. Um, I think that while there's, while there's, you know, an action in one area, you're also trying to put the best people, the best players on stage at the, at the correct time. And so, I mean, it's a really valid question, and, and at the same time, I think his performance, that, you know, we go back to this question about person and, and um, sort of human understanding and all of that. And I think uh, for a non-trans 
actor, he's doing a really amazing job, but I can't speak really 100% that because I don't know what, you know, what's missing. And I, would, and I just want to also ask, sure, I, think, I think we've been hearing a lot of questions about why are, why are these trans characters are being played by trans people? And I think I, I would hope that with the, the exposure of some of the current trans actresses and actors um, in the last couple of years that we will be able to see trans people be played by trans people. I think that's, the, I, I would like to see that uh, so that uh, we can see that um, the diversity of the actors um, are actually speaking to that specific experience. So, yeah. I mean, there I mean it's a little bit like, I mean, I, you know, y you have this question all the time, and it was, it, it was less complicated uh, in many ways when it sort of was simpler as in, you know, should women characters be written by women, or should men care? I mean, what are you missing when women write male characters, or vice versa? And you know, I think that the history of literature not supports the fact that women have insight into into men, and men have insight into women. And so, when you multiply that out, there is no answer for me. But I certainly understand where that question is coming from. I think we have time for one more question in the back. Yes. This is supposed to, oh, okay, it works, okay. <laughs> anyway, so I, I, was, I, I really enjoyed what you said about like the person and the character, and what you said uh, about the trans person playing a trans person, and I was actually thinking about that kind of, as kind of a, an evolution that maybe, uh, I mean, thinking about maybe Hollywood and you know um, how the casting might change in the future too, and you don't even have to hire like a trans person as a trans person, but as a person, and what I enjoy about this, t this series, which I uh, saw for the first time today, is that um, just the diversity and also the visibility and the uncertainty of the characters. You don't even know who's trans and who's not trans, but you know that something is going on about trans here, but, but then everything changes about the characters. So I really appreciated that. And I think this is, it's not just like a, a gender evolution, it's more like a spiritual evolution and like humanitarian and more. And, and I really appreciated it, so just wanted to say that. that. That's a, a pretty big compliment. Does anyone have a response, or should we, or should we end on that high note? I know, I know. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, please join me one last time in thanking both Rick and Clint for joining us this evening.